I'm a student of the Middle East. That's the area covering 23 nation states on planet Earth, from Mauritania in northwest Africa, across the whole line of northern Africa, to Egypt and Sudan, all the countries around the Arabian Peninsula. It's a stunning territory, 400 million souls, 30% of the population in that area under 30 years of age, I have to tell you. And in part of that area, at least half of it, they are blessed with extraordinary resources, vast seas of oil and gas. So looking at planet Earth, you would have thought the Middle East is one of the most privileged sectors of this planet and thriving. The awesome news I have to offer you is that the Arab world, as of March 2017, is in a desperate state. Almost across the Arab region, countries are dominated by dictators and oligarchs who've been milking these countries. There's a, a recent report of the United Nations on human development which talks of leaders in the Arab world having literally filched a trillion dollars from these countries over the last 50 years. Unemployment across the region, rampant. Reinvestment in the area, terrible. And the result is therefore that the Middle East is heaving with discontent and violence. Uh, there has been a revolution over the last six years. Sadly, it hasn't brought an Arab spring, and the figures from the UN suggest that in global terms, 45% of terrorism across this planet, and we've seen it this week in Westminster, has emerged from the Middle East. 58% of world refugees are emerging from that region, and 68% of battle-related deaths come from the Arab world as of now. The Middle East, at least large sectors of the Arab world, tragically are in a mess, not thriving. What I want to do is to juxtapose their situation with that of contemporary Israel, not to offer some nice, neat black and white contrast, because not for one second would I suggest that contemporary Israel is without problems. But the reality is the Israelis have looked at their situation strategically and have come up with fantastically positive responses. Contemporary Israel is that titchy little scrap of land northeast of Egypt, the slither along the Mediterranean coast. It's absolutely tiny, 300 miles by at very most 80-something wide. It's the same area as Wales. It has huge disadvantages. More than 60% of the land mass is desert, mostly mountainous, and therefore lousy for agriculture. It hasn't got any oil. It doesn't have that raw mineral wealth that's made countries in the region wealthy. They have latterly discovered some natural gas. It's got water problems, as do all the countries in the area. And global warming is felt in that part of the world. How then have they addressed their domestic situation? The eight million who make up the body politic of Israel, Jews, Christians, Muslims, a very widely scattered and, and diverse population. They have really come to the conclusion that they do have one resource that they can turn to advantage. And I say that not to flannel you, but it's the gray cells, the innovative creative abilities of guys, men and women like you. There is not a high school in Israel that doesn't have technology status. That doesn't mean to say they don't teach all the other subjects, but the reality is they do put an emphasis on technology. The sheer volume of students going up to read basic science or the applied sciences, electronics, um, the, the computer sciences, and the rest. Huge. And those with the greatest skills given unbelievable encouragement through a whole network of incubators to actually take raw ideas and work on them so that Israel has become a knowledge economy. And in the last 20 years, this country has absolutely gone through a transformative revolution. They've addressed their, their raw problems, like, for example, look, the issue of water. The reality is Israeli agro-scientists have developed the most effective irrigation systems anywhere so that water is used to maximum effect. Second of all, they recycle wastewater at a level higher than anywhere else on this planet. I'm not just hyping up the statistics, but we're talking about nearly 90% of all wastewater is converted for reuse in agriculture. And now by building a huge network along the Mediterranean coast of desalinization plants, there is now water available to populations 
around Israel and its neighboring areas so that the price of water is coming down. And for once, there, no, no, people are no longer talking about shortages and, and wars over water. In terms of the land, they've drawn the harsh conclusion that though Israel can grow brilliant oranges, Jaffa oranges, that isn't the way of the future. Farming is shrinking all the time, becoming ever more technological. Uh, instead of that, what they are doing is they are engaging in research in all sorts of high-tech fields, and then characters are commercializing and developing these ideas. If I give you a few examples, that will give you an idea of a global preeminence that they have because they are really playing in the Premier League today in terms of technology. In 1998, five Israeli teenagers, no doubt the bane of their teachers' lives, um, sold a product to AOL. They had created the very first serious messaging service, which some of you may recall. It went under the initials ICQ, namely ICQ. The raw reality is these five guys um, literally made this invention available as a free download. They collected tens of millions of names, which clearly were a set of addresses that AOL was interested in. And in 1989, this product was bought by AOL for 287 million US dollars. First down payment. That has been followed latterly by a whole brace of inventions in a variety of fields. Perhaps you've seen this pill cam, which is the bog standard now gizmo for looking at people who've got pains in their stomachs, invented by a team at the Technion in northern Israel. So any one of you guys, any one of you ladies in the room could develop pains in your stomach. Now to investigate what exactly is happening to you, you would be sent to a hospital in Kent or anywhere else where you'd be asked to swallow a pill which contains a piece of nanotechnology, a miniaturized camera, a pill that does not dissolve but which floats through the human frame, taking eight solid hours of travel through the body, taking a picture every other second. So now we can show you the full run of your inner geography, and the specialist can identify and diagnose what problems you have. A painless investigation which won prizes in technology all over the world. But that's been followed by a whole tranche of other ideas. Perhaps some of you runners in the room have seen pictures of an extraordinarily doughty lady, Claire Lomas. She lives in Leicestershire. She is a paraplegic, yet she has now taken part in two UK marathons, standing, walking on crutches, wearing a bionic suit invented by a quadriplegic in Israel, a suit that enables an individual chair, wheelchair bound to propel themselves forward with all sorts of impulses going through the leg in enabling the paraplegic to stand and jerkily walk forward. But I can add to that uh, two other of, of the more recent uh, innovations and technological contributions that have come out from Israel, which are utterly extraordinary. Uh, an Arab professor from the Technion, which is Israel's premier engineering university, who's created a nano device which he calls the Nanose, N-A-N-O-S-E. Uh, this is a device which actually acts as a breathalyzer and analyzes from people's breaths whether they are carrying bacteria, whether they are already profoundly sick and identifying what sickness they carry, and the degree of severity of that sickness. It's an extraordinary piece, piece of kit. But the most recent hot shot success of Israel is a company called Mobileye. They're producing a, a, an element for driverless cars. Uh, Intel has just bought out Mobileye for the absolutely eye-watering sum of 12 and a half billion pounds sterling. Now, I don't want to suggest to you for a minute that contemporary Israel is thriving and everything is going 
swimmingly well, because you wouldn't believe that, and it wouldn't be true of any society. Any open democratic society is going to have its strains and its domestic problems. That's inevitable. Not everybody is making it. Not everybody has these creative skills. So there is poverty, and there's intercommunal difficulties. And there are different views about how this society should surge forward. It is as democratically divided as the UK is, or the Netherlands, or the United States of America. Let's not speak of the fact that the Middle East is an area fraught with terrible tensions and violence that is on Israel's doorstep, and, and an unresolved conflict with the Palestinians. That is all a backdrop to all of this. And yet I can say to you that in the register of happiness, and there is a listing of states, Israel isn't quite up near the absolute top, the Nordic nation states win those plaudits. But actually, in terms of people's sense of engagement and involvement in their society, Israel is pretty high up in the global league of the 190-odd states that make up our planet. It's not just surviving. It's thriving. And it's a great story. And it's what I bring to you this morning.